Uh, our subject is the Old Testament build-up to the coming of the kingdom in Jesus. And we've seen that this build-up functions like three growing windows or, or visions of the coming kingdom in the Exodus event, in the Davidic monarchy, and in the prophetic promise of the kingdom. If one were to summarize the whole of the Old Testament material, one could say it like this, that in the Exodus event and the Davidic monarchy, Israel was able to make this confession, the Lord is King. Yahweh is now reigning over us. A present tense uh, confession of their experience. Having then lost the kingdom, and we will go into that presently, in the language of the prophets, and although this language is in all of them, I will particularly focus on Isaiah and Daniel, the material can be summarized as the Lord will become king. Just as Yahweh once was our king, so the day will come when once again he will become our king. But now it is in the language of a future hope. In between the zenith of the golden age of the Davidic monarchy, times of David and Solomon, and these uh, promises of the coming kingdom, you have the decline and collapse of Israel's experience of the kingdom of God. And you'll find, if you read the books of Chronicles and Kings, that there is a kind of a refrain. I've given one particular text there, but it normally goes something like this. King so-and-so died, and so-and-so his son became king in his stead, and he also did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, leading Israel to worship Baal and Asherah and other gods, and God raised up this prophet and that prophet to warn him, if you and the nation continue in this way, I will remove you from this place and you will lose the kingdom. And so first the northern kingdom and then the southern kingdom fell to foreign armies. And eventually in exile, back in a kind of uh, slavery like they were in, in Egypt, Israel is in the dark night of uh, depression really. And I find Psalm 137 articulates that so well because the Babylonians say, sing us some of your beautiful songs of Zion. And they hang up their harps and they say, we, how can we sing the songs of the Lord in a foreign land? We have lost our temple, we've lost our, our estates, we've lost our country, we are, we are now almost like slaves in a, in a different country. And uh, notice always the coming of the kingdom is associated with song. When Miriam danced, she sings that prophetic song. With the uh, golden age of the kingdom in David and Solomon, it was a time of thousands of worship songs being written. Now in exile, they can't even sing one song because the song has grown silent. And out of that dark night of, of exile, beginning in some of the pre-exilic prophets but becoming clearer in the exilic prophets, is the great promise of the coming kingdom. It begins in the language of somebody like Habakkuk, uh, chapter 3 in Habakkuk, where it simply is looking for a restoration of the past. And he takes the whole uh, story of the Exodus and the Mount Sinai revelation of God and he kind of glorifies it and says how magnificent it was. And then he says these sort of hopeful words that even though there's the fig tree doesn't blossom and there's no herds in the stall and there's no prosperity and we are in, in desperate plights, yet I will wait for the Lord and wait for the day when God will come back and do again what he did in the days of Moses and the days of David and, and uh, the Davidic monarchy. However, when you turn to the language of Isaiah and Daniel, something has changed. And epitomized in, in, in Isaiah's language, do not remember the things of the past. I am going to do a new thing. Something that will entirely eclipse the past. And uh, make even the great days of David and Solomon appear to be as nothing. As you read all of these prophets, and, and uh, they all are really saying the same thing, a type of standardized language is to be found, and it's often helpful to understand what this language is about. Many of them will talk about the day of the Lord. Um, 
which is really meaning the day when Yahweh will return with his kingdom. It's like code language for all of that. Some of them will say the latter days. And it's giving this idea that history as we know it now is dark and a long time will elapse, but sometime in the future these events will take place. Then some of them become more specific and say it will happen at the end of history. This world as we know it is so evil, it's going, it's going to have to terminate. And so it will be in the last days. And out of this language comes the whole idea of eschatology, because that simply is a word for saying the end or the last days. And then some of them would just codify the whole thing as that day. And in packed into that statement is that day when all of this happens. Now, the two uh, Old Testament prophets who influenced Jesus the most in his language and in his conception of himself are Isaiah and Daniel. And I'm particularly going to focus on Isaiah. The way I describe it is like this. All the prophets are showing the same movie in some way about the coming kingdom. But some of them it's like looking on a small screen that I have in front of me. Some of them it's a bigger screen like that screen over there. And it's quite a good movie. But beautiful movie right now, I think. Um, and uh, some of them it's on a, on a huge screen, you know. But if those of you who've been to an IMAX theater will know that when you see the same movie on an IMAX theater, it is far more overwhelming. Isaiah paints a picture of the coming kingdom on a huge canvas. And uh, what I'm going to do is try to summarize very briefly this massive picture of the coming kingdom in Isaiah. Can I also say that in my book Breakthrough, which is uh, on sale there, a bit of a commercial, and in the New Wine Bible Institute curriculum, there is a whole chapter where all I do is take text out of Isaiah and arrange them in the structure that I'm going to present to you now. Because I think unless you read his language and hear the way he says it, you can't see the movie. And I cannot do justice in you know, just a few minutes to explain the, the amazing picture that he describes. But here is an attempt to summarize Isaiah's vision of the coming kingdom. First and foremost, it will be a time when God himself, Yahweh himself, will intervene in history. He has amazing images. One image is that the glory of God will be so great that the sun will be embarrassed to shine. So great will be the glory of God. Another picture is of a great flood that has been building up and waiting, and then suddenly it will burst upon us. And so will be the day of Yahweh coming. Then there are equally a whole lot of passages about a descendant of David coming who is greater than David ever was, with more anointing on him than David ever had. Uh, in fact, all nations will be attracted to him in some way. And then, of course, those famous servant passages, which the people of Israel never quite sufficiently connected to the Messiah, of the suffering servant in whom the covenant is restored and uh, through whom the, the failure of the nation is absorbed and redeemed uh, and forgiven. Then there are wonderful passages, very poetic passages, about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, most of his image is about water running, uh, um, rain falling, so much that there are floods and rivers, and then images of the dry wilderness being transformed into flowers, into a growing forest, and into superabundance. And this is a picture not only of what God will do to all of reality, but how God's people will suddenly flourish like new growth uh, in the wilderness. And it is a picture of, a, of, of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is totally uh, superabundant, associated with the coming of God's glory and the coming of the Davidic uh, descendant. In all of this, Isaiah's key word that he uses again and again is the word salvation. If the word shalom uh, summarizes the Davidic monarchy, the word salvation summarizes what Isaiah is on about. And if you unpack all the passages where he talks about salvation, it is a comprehensive understanding of God arriving and doing all these things. It involves the forgiveness of sins. In that day, Isaiah says, God will blot out the transgressions of his people. 
It will involve the healing of the sick. Nobody in Zion will be sick in that day, one text says. It will involve the liberation of every form of captivity. And many of the songwriters have, have captured this part of Isaiah's language. The, the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will leap. Uh, the, those who are in dungeon and prisoners will come out into the light. And uh, every form of human bondage will be replaced with liberty. Then, shalom. But this time... Isaiah is articulating a kind of shalom that far exceeds uh, what was occurring in the times of the Davidic monarchy. And so he uses impossible language to describe how amazing it is. He talks about the lion and the lamb and the deadly snake and your two-year-old two child playing in the back garden and nobody eats anybody else. Uh, it's like an impossible picture. And for those of you who, who might know I come from Africa, uh, it's particularly graphic for us because I grew up with black mambas and things like that. So, it will be a time of, of peace that eclipses any previous conception of peace. Not surprisingly, he then pushes this to its ultimate conclusion, that death itself, the ultimate disgrace, will be reversed. And one of his um, pictures is of a whole graveyard standing up out of the grave and shouting for joy. I'd love to be in the middle of a graveyard when that happens. It'd be a rather amazing experience. Um, and so God's glory will come and reverse uh, death itself. And then it's not surprising that because of all of these things, uh, there will be the feast to end all feasts, the party to end all parties, that will make the feast of Solomon's table look like a Sunday school picnic by comparison. In fact, God will be a ho the host all nations will be his guests. He will serve the best of meats and the finest of wines. So I tell our people back home that uh, the Cape where I come from, where there are about 500 estates within an hour of my home, uh, will never be transformed in the millennium. It will just go straight through into uh, the next age. And I like to put that little piece in uh, for other reasons, that God will serve the finest of wine. As a result of this party, and also let, let me say, there are wonderful passages about song, about from the islands of the north and the extremities of the earth, songs of praise and of freedom and of joy. And one of the passages about the celebration is that God's presence on his people will be so great that all of creation will join in the, in the song and that the trees will begin to wave about to the beat of your music and the hills will start hopping around to the, to the beat of your song. Um, and, uh, of course, you need to travel somewhere from here to get real mountains, but um, <laughs> those of you who live with mountains, it's quite a majestic picture of, you know, imagine if we were doing one of our songs and then you just saw the horizon going to the same beat. Um, the whole of creation transformed because of this great coming of God. As a result of this, all of reality really is going to be changed so that the world as we know it has to be replaced with a new order, a new era, a new day, a new age. And so there will be a new people of God, uh, the diaspora will be reversed, but added to the returning Israelites will be people from every nation. They will be gathered into the new Jerusalem, which will be the capital city of all peoples. It will be a city that comforts and nourishes all those who come. And again, he uses impossible images. He talks about this great mother with breasts that feed all the nations. And they fall asleep in her arms and have a feeling of safety and tranquility. Uh, I call it a picture of, of Mama Jerusalem, who, who is this wonderful place. Um, then he pushes it through to its ultimate conclusion that really everything that is broken in this creation will be restored and there will be a new heaven and a new earth where God's uh, rule and reign is supreme over all things. And therefore, necessarily, everything that is evil will be judged. Every dictator, every proud ruler who has come up against God will be put down. And there are the, those terrifying passages of the worm that never stops eating and the fire that never stops burning because God will have removed forever everything that uh, is evil and has come up against his government. So it's a complete picture of 
of the coming of God's kingdom. And when Jesus stood up and said, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. All of this is inherent in that announcement. Whenever you hear the phrase in the New Testament, the coming of God's kingdom, you've got to remember that whole picture. Then in Daniel, 